Baker, everyone. Baker. Welcome to Minute by Minute Awake podcast. Uh, this week, we actually have a special guest. So it won't be a regular minute. We're speaking to Neil Patel. Neil, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing brilliantly. I'm doing absolutely amazing. Thank you for having yeah. me. What a few. Can't wait. Can't wait to speak to you. And uh, as always, we, we have Priyank and Mike. Priyank, how are you today? Very cold. I was going to move to my living room, but it's zero degrees in there, so that's not happening. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, not, I'll not say about the boarding hot temperatures in Brazil. I thought we were going to stop the weather reports. The weather reporting. <laughs> People are tuning in for the weather reporting right now in LA. Yeah, sorry, Neil. We've, we've, been, we've been trying not to ever talk about weather, but we're just so British that we love talking about weather, even, even Mike. Notice on your podcast if you're weather or not. it. People tune in for it. Mike, how are you doing for it? How are you doing? Yeah, it's a bit windy, but other than that, no, it's, it's fine, yeah. I'm good. Crisp. Good. Yes. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, Neil, uh, as way of an introduction, you are a, a very interesting uh, individual looking looking you up, uh, doing a bit of research ahead of this call. Um, you know, I was watching YouTube videos of you rapping. Um, you know, I was reading articles of you being in Parliament. Uh, and, and just really looking through your website on Chikri, reading about yoga and everything that you're doing there. Super, super interesting guy. Um, what, what are you doing at the moment? What's, what's your focus? Um, you would, would you call yourself a rapper? Would you call yourself a yoga instructor? Um, how, would you, how would you define yourself? Human, man. Just, just, I'm just, <laughs> so, I'm just human whatever I feel like doing every second of the day, which is why it looks like such a mishmash of, of a person and personality and a bit of a misfit because I have made sure I've had no lines and barriers in my head I'll jump into whatever I feel I want to do um, so yeah at the moment I'm working on a hip-hop project I'm working on a, on a book and I'm working on yoga classes and uh, I'm working on the Mahabharata book at the moment the Mahabharata so I'm doing a it's a six-year project it's already six years I've gone on that um, I'm looking at it from a few sideways different angles not just going through the story but you know, why the number 108 appears so many times, how UFOs come up in the Mahabharata so many times, um, the, the lineage from Vishnu all the way down to the Yadavs in the current modern society and in world. So just looking sideways at the Mahabharata, so I'm busy on that. I'm writing a book on, on cancer, which we'll talk about a bit, little bit later on, the, on how the quantum biology goes into the, the, the curing of cancer. Um, working on taking some knives off the street so people stop stabbing each other for no goddamn reason in London. There's a lot of knife crime around, and that's through a hip hop project. And I'm going to be setting up a uh, a few new courses, let's just say, in the new year of yoga, um, and then just managing the operation of Chikri, which is which is we'll get on today to an organisation, a spiritual organisation. So quite busy in a few different areas. Getting to the gym when I can as well. <laughs> Our uh, the thread the thread that binds us is obviously Guruji who is uh, behind us Paramahansa Yogananda. Tell us when, how how you met Guruji. Well, it was my mother was 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 the one right. So my mom actually became a, a disciple of Yogananda. It must have been in about 1980, 81, um, when she was ill. Someone handed her a book. Uh, when she actually had cancer and someone handed her a yoga book, Yogananda's book to read. And then, so obviously from the age of, you know, whatever it was, seven, eight years old, I grew up in a house where Yogananda was already there. So he became my guru by default because his presence is like, I'm here, I, I own your living room. <laughs> you see me every day and my eyes will watch you go left and right. It was just, it was just like the third parent in the house by, 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 his, by his presence. So he became my, my master, my guru by, by that. And my mom was a yoga teacher. So yoga and Yogananda just, was just life. And then she took me to all the meditations, to Mother Center, to meet Dayamata. I met Dayamata when I was you know, 14, 15 years old or something like that, um, which is another wild experience of its own. And, and so my life was just, Yogananda was just there. And Yogananda just still is there. And I don't know any different other than him. And then eventually I took Kriya initially, initiation myself in my mid-twenties. Um, and that's, that's how I met Yogananda in a, 
answer to your question. Nice I don't story. know me, he just came. I'm, I'm in your life. <laughs> and I'm going to control you. <laughs> you're, you're certainly um, taking a unique path. Uh, um, this podcast is slightly off the beaten path. Um, some people were complaining to us, but you have gone completely on a tangent to all things self-realization fellowship, haven't you? I have. I have. I have. Um, self-realization fellowship, if, if you're asking, it's, it's at the core of everything that I am because it really introduced and, and gave the basis for yoga and Yogananda to be around today. We wouldn't have, I guess we wouldn't have access to Yogananda without us. So full respect goes there. And it's the foundation of everything that I know. Mother Center, Lake Shrine, Hollywood Temple, Miami Temple, London Temple, as well as Sarath. But then of course, um, me being so creative by nature, my mother was also a dancer, um, that creativity was in our house. So I'm guessing Yogananda came to say, right, let's try and use this guy's creative ability for some good. So he doesn't just go completely off the rails and on some mad hip hop life and mission. Let's try and use some of that to do something good. So I think Yogananda utilized my ability to create and the yoga business, which was in our house, as a way of, I guess, reaching further and in different darker corners of SRF than SRF into the street and the hip hop world and the, the gangs and stuff that I was involved with as a young boy. SRF went, Yogananda went there. And, you know, I ended up creating a yoga school of 30 years now. I've had uh, this yoga school. Yogananda's gone everywhere I've gone. But because SRF has its pure, pure way of doing things, which is absolutely needed, I, I didn't work through SRF as much because I thought it should remain pure. But I took the Yogananda and the blessings and the goodness of SRF and Yogananda into my own little creative, crazy place where I attracted the creative, crazy people. <laughs> and then once they came to me and I said, okay, now the master's over there. I'm just the guy in the middle, get it, right? You go over there to SRF and I sent everyone to SRF from that point. And loads of people have gone since. Everybody knows Yogananda because they know Chikri uh, or the other way around. Whatever. <laughs> and the, the premise of this podcast is, is really, you know, an analysis, minute by minute analysis of, of the awake documentary tell, tell us maybe about the first time you watched it what what, what was the immediate impact uh what did you think well i watched it years ago i mean it was out how many years five years ago or something like that must mm. be it was amazing the documentary was absolutely brilliant i loved it um but i think what hit me about the documentary more than anything else was probably was probably yogananda's how he developed an organization, how he actually, and I think that perhaps only until you've, you've built a school of yoga yourself, or you've had to look after thousands of people and train people and graduate people and develop people in meditation and yoga, which is what I've done, you don't realize how complicated and difficult organizations are and can be. There are a lot of work and a lot of people and personalities to manage who want different things, right? So when I, when I saw how Yogananda went through different processes and complications, then I really related to that. It's quite difficult to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I've really felt a lot of empathy and um, sympathy, if, if it's possible, for Yogananda and how hard it was, the background work that it takes to run and manage and keep people happy spiritually on a spiritual group. That, I think, is what I took from it. Um. <clears throat> When Yogananda, he's often attributed to the person who brought yoga to the West, um, but he didn't really put Hatha yoga at the center of his teachings. Do you, do you have an idea why, why that might be? Well, I can tell you one thing. I, I love Hatha yoga. It's been my bread and butter in, in many respects, or at least it's brought people to meditation because people's first entrance point is the body. But I can see why he stayed away from it because it also attracts the wrong kind of attention in the sense that a lot of people get fixated on the body and the body becomes the goal and then you're stuck right because the body is such a gross version of the ego that it's very hard to then separate yourself from the body so people get stuck on how the body looks what asana they can do that's what position someone can do that someone can't do how they could do one position one day and five years later they can't do it are am i going backwards now and you know the body can be a bit of a block to real yoga which you guys will understand is, is union with god so 
I think going down the rabbit hole of yoga is <clears throat> asana probably was something that he avoided probably consciously. Because remember, back when Yogananda was around, people were still infatuated with the body. You know, you had Mr. Universe, Miss Universe contest. You had, you know, probably around that time, martial arts was coming out in America. So Bruce Lee and all that stuff. So people were fixating on the body. Arnold Schwarzenegger was probably a young boy or in competition. Uh, you know, I don't know. But, you know, weightlifting, I know, was big in those days. And even yoga gymnastics was still big because his brother, Yogananda's brother, was, um, was, was Bhishma. Right? What was his name? Vishnu, yeah, Vishnu. So he was, yeah. Mm. I forget his name, but Gosh, mm. the Gosh lad. Um, and he was, he was mm. big on yoga, Bikram. Was it Bikram? Mm. Bikram was, yeah, another chap, yeah. Another one. Yeah. But, it, but, but it was big. So I think he avoided it for that reason. But it's a rabbit hole, and who knows what people are going to take from it. But I've certainly seen that in the West, some people get lost in the world of the physical body and miss the point. And if he was going to master anything, probably he wanted to master the metaphysical part. Mm. Good response. We were just discuss we were discussing this the other day, actually, on, on the previous minute. Uh, we were talking about, um, oh, like, you know, he taught, he taught Hatha Yoga to some of his students. And, you know, in the film, there's pictures of people doing asanas, um, but SRF doesn't teach it. And we were just talking about the, the, why, why the emphasis has stayed on Kriya, Kriya proper and meditative practices as opposed to you know because as soon as you go into hatha yoga you don't just go into hatha yoga there's all there's you know there's all the other hindu sciences that are that are there isn't it and then there it becomes such a big vast uh, teaching and without a guru at the forefront then it's a dangerous dangerous space i suppose i think it's a simple a, sim a simple thing about time and energy that you have in life you, you have that much only right and if he was going to do so anything he'd probably want to do it properly so mm. if you get back to hatha yoga He'd probably need to really spend a good portion of his life, probably half of it, sorting that out. Mm. Whereas what he could end up doing, had he not done that, is write the books that he needed to write. And I, well, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of him, but, <laughs> but you know, ex explore more of the metaphysics and, and the meditation. So I think it was a, a smart, intelligent decision to avoid it. And I say that as someone that you know professes a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> it's been you know the most amazing part of my life and it, and it is an incredible thing Hatha yoga is incredible for the human body it's so revivifying health giving but i just say you know in, in all my classes i try to make people make sure that they're aware that it's not the full stop in the in the paragraph it goes on a lot longer than Hatha yoga maybe you could tell us a little bit about the history of how you got to blend yoga and maybe talk about the type of yoga you really practice and hip hop uh in your in your uh, own school and have you been doing this for full 30 years or is it something that's developed over time uh, there's five questions there mr let <laughs> 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 uh, me go back um the hatha yoga um like i said my mother was a teacher so it, it came to me very naturally i think genetics played a big part because she was naturally an indian dancer doing bhayatnatyam and kathak dance which are very stressful on the body. So you needed to be good with the body. And then she was very good at yoga naturally, asana. So I think I was very lucky. I could pick it up at 17, 18, 19 and be able to start doing hatha yoga quickly. But then with Guru there, looking over my shoulder the whole time, it was always like, but this isn't yoga only, Neil. Pick up the autobiography, pick up Man's Eternal, all these things. So as a kid, a teenager, I'm, I'm thumbing through these books thinking that oh my god yoga is not these postures it's all this stuff as well so then the classes had to represent that so then from the very beginning my classes at the end we'd always do pratyahara which is sense withdrawal right as you know in deep relaxation yoga nidra and then from there from 19 20 21 years old i started to teach meditation spontaneously now i didn't know a lot about his teachings because i wasn't a lesson member or, or anything but you could piece it all together. And being a yoga teacher, you know relaxation, you know the body, you know the asana, you piece, and being creative anyway, you piece the meditation scene, you make them up, you just go with the flow. You know pranayama anyway, because you're a yoga teacher. So the classes became spiritual. Even though Yogananda wasn't telling me what to do, was, they became very spiritual. So that kind of, the classes, classes changed that way. But then I was a musician, and I was a rapper, and a DJ. 
So I'm coming from a group of people who every weekend there were big gang fights, right? And it was messy in the world that I was in. It was, you were just running away from being beaten up or you were in a gang chasing somebody down. It was a rough, rough world. So I had these two worlds happening, this hip hop, gang, nasty world, drink, drugs, all that happening. And then the pure yoga and Yogananda. So what do I do? How do I choose? What do I do next with my life? So mix it all together, mix it all, mix, mix, mix everything. So then I talked to the hip hop people about meditation and yoga and rap to them about it. And then to the meditation people and the yoga people, I say, hey, don't forget the people on the street. Right? They're not going to understand all this pure yoga. They're not going to open up a copy of Awake or Autobiography of a Yogi. So how are you going to communicate to them? So then I'm stuck in when I think, well, the only person that can do this job is going to be me. So what do I do? Oh, I need to build something. So then I built Chikri Yoga. And Chikri Yoga became this, the middle ground of everything. So then in the classes, we'll play hip hop music. We'd swear it if it happened to be there, right? Because then the people on the street could go, oh, okay, I'll get the music, then we'll do some asana, everything, moving around postures, some hip hop yoga, blending the asana with hip hop. And then at the end of the class, we meditate. So then those people are like, what the hell is this? But Neil's there, so it's cool, okay. <laughs> so what do you want, what, I want, you want us to sit like this? Okay, you want us to breathe? Okay. And who's this God thing? And why, does, why, does, why is God broken? Because the world is a mess. Explain that to me. And then who is that guy with the long hair? That's Yogananda. Okay. So we do that. I do that job, right? And then I go to yoga shows and I rap there. The yoga show is like, what, what, why do you want to rap at a yoga show? Because I'm going to teach people on the street about the yoga stuff. So then we take that direction backwards from yoga show down to hip hop back to the street. So that was it. That's why my life is a mess. Because <laughs> I'm going left and right. But I think... I, I think that was every now and then you need somebody that's going to just do that job of mixing everything. I think that's Shikri Yoga. That's what I do. You're, you're shining a light into what would be a darker area of lack of knowledge, so to speak. Like I said, if, if the conversation isn't even being brokered, you know, mm -hmm. how are you going to reach people, right? So you're kind of shining that little like flashlight into the area. It's a, a, amazing work. I mean, I, I, I saw, it's funny, you mentioned a few things. I, I'll not take up all the questions, guys, I, I promise. But you mentioned a few things there about playing the music, Biggie Smalls and Tupac and swear words are pretty pretty uh, heavy. How, how do you reconcile the, the two, you know, when you're looking at yoga, which is going within this lack of ego, then you've got this such a strong, uh, force of will, which is Biggie, Biggie Smalls and, and the, other, the rest of the guys coming in saying things that they're saying. How do you really, how do you reconcile the two? Well, I just think it's just being real, guys. It's just being honest and genuine and authentic. And not, you know, I don't, because I've been brought up with yoga. Okay, this, this is a good way to explain it. I was brought up with yoga. And so yoga was second nature to me. Now, what I've seen a lot of is people get with yoga because it's cool. And it becomes, or because it's the new thing, or because they want to experience floating out of the body or something wild, it's all ego, right? So there's no ego in me when it comes to yoga. Yoga is like eating for me, it's natural. So I can spot ego in yoga, and I don't like it. I see a lot of people when they get yoga, they're like, oh, I'm a yogi now, so I'm special, right? I'm good, I'm elevated, I don't swear. And if I do swear, God will forgive me, and all my habits are clean. But it's wrong because you lot, everyone in yoga is making mistakes we're just not honest about it we get stressed we swear we eat crap food we do think we shout at our partners we get jealous we do all the wrong things but we're not honest about it so if in a yoga class i play music and once every now and then somebody swears don't tell me you don't get angry don't tell me you've never cursed be honest so my point is look i can smell the bs a million miles away be honest, if you're a yoga teacher and you get angry, tell it, you tell your class, I got angry too. You know, this is my thing. So that's why I don't filter too much because I want people to realize that you don't have to pass a qualification to be a yoga student. You don't have to pass a quali qualification to be in Yogananda's lesson program. You just have to be real. 
Otherwise, what, other, what, what happens otherwise is people think you have to be pure to do yoga. You have to, you think, oh, but I listen to hip hop, so I can't do yoga. And that's exactly where you came from, right? Your question came from, oh, but there's lines, not that you believe it, but people believe it. They believe that I can't do yoga because I can't do this, I can't do that. And I can't listen to hip hop because I do yoga. Actually, no, <laughs> the world doesn't work like that. And you as an individual don't. So you're like um, an ambassador, I would say, of spirituality and yoga to a, a broader range of people. Um, do you often see um, transformations in the people who come to you? And is that a gratifying experience? Well, how, how does that come about, actually? Because I'm just imagining someone that, uh, you know, some, some of the guys from my school, they, they, would, they wouldn't even look in the direction of spirituality and, be, you know, they think it's all crazy and it's not cool, right? But I can't even imagine them. Uh, how how would that transformation come about with those guys that I'm you know those guys in my college that I used to hang out with? Some of it is natural. So what happens is those guys in your college, my well, people that I know when I'm younger, naturally as you grow up, life beats you down, right? You're you you're, you're egotistical. You're big. The world is yours when you're 19, 20, and then when you're 30, life has beat you down, and you're looking for a flipping answer, right? You need help. So they knew me at school. Now they know me at 35 years old, whatever, and they're like, oh, uh, the yoga stuff that Neil was talking, maybe that's my answer. So then they can approach me because I'm approachable. They know me, they know where I've come from. So they can approach me that way. So that's that, That's how, is you're a figure in their life that they can reach and say, oh, I know that guy, or he's rapping about something. But honestly, on terms of transformation, the people that I know that we would have never done yoga before that have come because they're unrelatable, the transformations and the life-changing experiences that they've had because of that are, are literally that. They're just life-changing. But when you go on to the level of, from me, those that have gone from me to Yogananda, their lives will never be the same again, even in their next incarnation. And that is gratifying. Not the people that have changed because of me, but the ones that went from me to the guru, that is, makes me feel like my entire life was worth living. Mm -hmm. because you know you know what it is right i mean you, when you've introduced somebody to guru you take no reward for that but my god don't you feel like i'm just, they're safe now my mom's my mom once said to me because my mom introduced me to guru right obviously she said to me when i knew that you were on the path properly i felt you were safe now and it's almost like she felt as a mother her job was done because i'm in guru's hands now right so and likewise with chikri yoga the people that I've brought through hip hop or through this or through that into, into Chikri Yoga, they're in my hands now. I can't flip and look after them. But when they're in Guru's hands, I know, done. That's gratifying. Um, Neil, you touched on something that a uh, slight tangent from what you said about your mother. Um, one, um, um, a young mother actually just contacted our, us on, on our, some of our social media feeds and, they, and she said, um, oh, um, you know, I, I'm really getting into meditation and spirituality. Uh, but you know she's got a young daughter I feel like it's taking if, if I go too much in that direction I feel like my relationship with her in some way will diminish so I'm scared that I shouldn't go too much in this direction because I have this family so what, what, what advice would you give her well the bottom line is I do teach a training course so I teach people about yoga and <clears throat> it's meaning and everything look we have to remember one thing that it's not about whether you do raja yoga kriya yoga bhakti yoga japa yoga mantra yoga asana yoga any yoga yoga is yoga yoga is union with god if this mother spends 50 percent of her time doing raja yoga meditation kriya yoga and 50 percent of her time working on being great with karma yoga and bhakti yoga loving her the god in her child and serving selflessly the god in her child god, the, the god is going to look on both things as being favorable equally this is why we have karma yoga and bhakti yoga and japa yoga and all the different yogas because god doesn't god is not like i'm going to take the raja yogis first and all the bhaktis will leave at the back and all the karma mm -hmm. yogas that's easy they can come right last the charity people they can come right at the end god doesn't work like that it's like how how did you much did you mean this union with me how much did you mean it and what was your real feeling like when you served a person hungry on the street or when you loved your child when she was sick and you didn't come to me in meditation how much was your depth of meditation he cares about intensity 
not past, like your real, genuine, authentic motivation, intention, and driving force. What was that? So I'd say to that mother, wherever you go, God is there. Never think that there's a better or a worse way to find God. He's absolutely everywhere. So look at God in your child. Look at God in the meditation center. So you're saying that even through, um, so I think we would talk about meditation, being meditative in your day-to-day actions and family life you can approach that even as a meditation you know as a selfless service you know you said bhakti devotion that uh, that mentality is is the all-important uh, aspect and that in itself is a transformative experience. look I, I tell you what it's in some ways it's arguably easier to meditate than it is to be a good human being an excellent human being an ex or 20 if you can be an excellent human being for 24 hours in a day Right, I'll 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 turn <laughs> my life to you now. <laughs> that is difficult. Being being wise, being forgiving, being loving, being generous, being honest, being authentic, being real every minute of the day. Right, that's hard, man. You're sitting alone and meditating. Okay, at least you're on your own. And there's no one hassling you. You've got your own demons, but you know you've got the world hitting you 24 hours a day. That's hard, man. So I would say there's. I don't like tears. I don't like, 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 I don't like levels or barriers. Everything is everything. You do everything, you do anything with God in your heart, you've, you've done it. With, you've done all that God needs you to do. And, and it's very wrong. I mean, look, Yogananda speaks about it, doesn't he, in one of his talks about if you are on your way to the church or something and someone's dying and lying in a ditch and you forget them and you go to the church, one of his lectures, it's not, God's not going to look at you very happy that you wanted to get church on time so you left someone in a ditch. Why? That's not how God works. God is in the person in the ditch. You've got to stop going to church and go and look after the person. And it's the same principle. If she has to stop her meditation to look after a child, God is going to be more happy than she carried on her meditation and ignored the child. Mm-hmm. Approach. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got to get rid of his selfish spirituality. We can become very selfish on the spiritual part. People don't realize it. They think that doing meditation is 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 a selfless act it's not it's a selfish act unless you do it with the, the understanding that you're you're in the context of a human society where there are people and things and others around you which you must take care of and god has been all those things meditation in context i'm sure guruji said you know meditation and activity no mm. Mm. yeah that's a little, little bit about that um sorry frank do you, do you want to go no no you go continuation um the, the Topic on illness, you said you were writing a book, you know, helping others, I guess, similarly related to this subject. You know, first off, you know, what is it in a little bit more detail? And if I may ask a second question as before, you know, what motivated you to, to get, get into the subject of healing? Illness, yeah, disease. Um, more than anything, you, you know, I have cancer, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much you guys... We have. didn't, we didn't know, no. Okay, I didn't so know I that, have, no. I have, I have had cancer for the last 21 years. I was diagnosed in the year 2000 with um, something called sarcoma, which is muscle, muscle cancer. And um, their idea was to do chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. But um, where it is, is in my left leg. So it takes up about one and a half kilograms of weight. It's a massive tumor. It's still here today. And they were going to either amputate the leg or severely disable me. But then we know with cancer that it has a tendency to travel anyway. So then it goes to your lungs, then it goes to your brain. So they gave me a few years to live and no, and one year to live if I didn't do any of their treatments. Okay. So this is me, a yoga teacher now with cancer in my left leg, which is not very helpful. I'll just let you know, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's my leg. Um, so I needed to try and find a way out of that and, and to live and to have my leg. So I tried some juice therapies for two years to try and try and try and get rid of my cancer. It didn't work. We didn't get rid of it. Same in my life, but we didn't get rid of it. I avoided chemotherapy and radiotherapy to begin with, because I knew that for me, they were not the answer. And then in the end, when I was just left with cancer in 2002, and no, I tried Chinese medicine, I read that everything just wouldn't get rid of it. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to have to live with this, man. I'm either, I'm either going to die or I'm going to live with cancer, but I'm just stuck, man. But I've got to deal with this shit, this stuff. But, um, so I turned to Guru and he said, you deal with it. 
if you want me to live, I'll live. If you want me to go, I go, right? That's, that's, that's it. And I said to God, you, you deal with it. You tell me what to do. What am I going to do? So after a while, they, Guru or God or my soul or whatever just started to feed me information about how I'm going to manage this cancer on my own. And of course, it came through meditation, positive thinking, what I call mind yoga, which were proverbs that used to come spontaneously to me from some other place, which used to teach me things. Um, and then I managed to look into it a bit more detail. Five years went, 10 years went, 15 years went. My doctors just came back and they said, some miracle has happened in you. We've never seen anybody live with cancer like this before. You should be dead. You're a ghost. Da, da, da. What are you doing in the end? They asked me and I said, I'm doing yoga. They're like, Pfft. Well, everybody should be doing then yoga if, if, if this is what's keeping you alive. So look, cut a long story short, I'm here 22 years later, I have cancer, I still have it, it's still active, it's still grade three, and I'm using the power of my mind, the power of meditation, the blessings from God, uh, mind control to, to overwhelm it with positive energy so it doesn't spread in my body. And I have taught yoga for 22 years on this dodgy leg, I've done it. And now I've written a book. Uh, now I've written a book, which is actually a second edition of a book I released in 2008 called What is Disease, which is a very small book, um, which explains what I did. But now I'm going into further detail and looking into the science behind it, which is where I come with the quantum biology, which is how we go through the wormhole of thought in our head and get into our biology and adjust it. Ep, um, epigenetics, how we're controlling our genes through our mind, or I go into that, and to all the different scientific um, uh, proofs of what I did spontaneously, what the gods gave me as inspiration to do spontaneously, and um, now how it works scientifically. And the book contains a full diary of what I went through, how I dealt with the diagnosis of cancer, how I fought it in my mind, and now I'm putting it on paper for other people to, to hopefully um, it, be inspired and come through their cancer as well yeah that is inspiring and it relates a little bit almost to the wake film you know, the, one of the one of the speakers in the film was dr anita goel and she talks about um so she's a physician and a physics um uh, professor so she does both and she's combined both fields and in that she talked um, she talks about she's doing uh, world leading research on writing and reading and writing dna individual DNA enzymes and that's talked about she talks a little about it in the in the film and I, I like I liked how you've without doing the research you've uh, somehow managed to apply it through your own practices yeah now I'm now I'm doing the research I'm realizing that it was it was a, a good decision but look coming back to Yogananda again it was inspired by Yogananda mm. I was sitting in a hospital in Mexico having no idea what I'm going to do which way I'm going to turn next because nothing was working and Yogananda's little book, Scientific Healing Affirmations. Yeah, what do you need in life? When you've got that book to inspire you, <laughs> I'm looking at it and it's, it's, it's giving me the sense that it's up here. Just use your head somehow, find a way. And then, you know, and, and with, with Yogananda's stick in the mud, which kind of like, that's the level. If Yogananda can do anything, you know, then he's going to inspire me to do this with cancer. If he can do it with anything, I can do it with cancer. And he, he gave us so much confidence that we can do things like this. So who am I to, you know, it's almost an, an embarrassment, an insult to Yogananda if I don't, if I, if I do not, if I do not take faith in what he says and fight my cancer with it. Because he gave us the tools, not just, not just for anything, he gave us the tools for everything. So I'm just going to apply them to my cancer. And look, it's worked. Through Yogananda's teachings and grace, mm -hmm. I I've created a miracle that my own professors are saying it's a modern miracle. We've not seen anyone do this with cancer. My cancer is so large. The amount is huge. No one survives when you leave it by itself. No chemo, no radiotherapy, no, I just left it. And I've never seen it before. This is Yogananda. This is the, this is the guru. This is why you have a guru. Because he does, he inspires you in moments like that. And he teaches you in your soul, in your meditations. He's talked to me constantly in the last 20 years how to get rid of this, how to deal with this cancer. And he still talks to me. And then I went and done a talk at the um, Indian High Commission in London about this subject of cancer. They called me to do a talk to all the delegates from India and everywhere. 
Um, and then I went to India and I was asked to do a talk at the World Yoga Conference in front of the ministers of the government of India. And I told them about this. So, but it's Yogananda behind me, giving me the inspiration and me with my big mouth that doesn't stop, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm motor mouth and I'm the rapper and I'm the, the yoga instructor and the organization head. He gets the right people at the right time. <laughs> To the degree where he even said to me, look, if it, if it was so that I get that I allowed cancer to happen to you deliberately, just to prove how my power is over cancer, is that okay? And I said, that's fine. God was like, if I gave you cancer and I cured it in you and showed the world, is that okay? Fine. Do what you got to do. It's a story. We're all just living in fictional drama in God's dream, in Vishnu's dream. We're just asleep. It's not Neil that's got cancer. It's Vishnu's dream, his idea of what he wants this yuga to be influenced by. So why let my ego get in the middle of it? Or give me cancer, get rid of it. Do what you want to do. It doesn't matter. I'm not here anyway. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yes. Uh, we've, talked about, we've talked about rap and uh, hip-hop enough. Let's talk about your video, the, of the, your music video, The Key. And I'm going to just play a little element of it so people can know what we're talking about. Here it is. Prepare to understand the true, uniting message of Christ and the Yoga, and society's prepared to change. called the key and it sounds like you almost talked about the key in the last uh, two minutes when you're talking about your <laughs> your resolution your you know yourself self i'm just remembering when we when we made that video it was that's in temple church in london it's a very difficult um, place to get access to and we had to sell them a bit of a, a dream when we rang them up and said we need to hire your temple your church <clears throat> because remember i'm saying in this video christ was a yogi yeah. in a Christian church, right? So I rang them up. I got my, my staff to ring them up and say, we need to hire this church. And they were like, what do you need to hire it for? And, 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 they, and we said, um, it's to bring Christianity further. We've got a message to bring Christianity further. And like, oh, okay, that sounds good. Come in, you've got it for an hour. We hired it, we paid them, Temple Church. Went in there with my camera crew, sent the cameramen everywhere. Just said, right, we've got 45 minutes, got to get in there, get out before they actually come in and listen to the lyrics. <laughs> it's, it's like, okay. yeah. Right? <laughs> So I ran around the church, rap, 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 got all the camera angles, done all the, the, the stuff, came out and um, got the video like, yes, we've got it. And then we got a phone call a couple of days later from Temple Church in London saying, so what did you do in our church? Because things were moved around and you were sitting on in a place where you shouldn't have been sitting and the, you were here, you were there, I heard. What, what are you doing in there? Can you send us uh, the tape of what you recorded? So I was like... Um, we're done, man. This tape's going to be burnt. <laughs> I was like, um, I said, no, it was to help Christianity go further. He goes, but where? Go further to who? And I said, to the uh, Hindu community. We're, we're going to take yoga to the Hindu and convert them into to, 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 to Christ followers. <laughs> they said, how are you going to do that? And I said, because I'm going to say, you know, Christ was a yogi and things like this and just make them understand it in a different way. They said, we want to see the tape. <laughs> So I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to be clever here. I'm going to be, I'm going to be Krishna in, in the Mahabharat club. <laughs> <clears throat> so I wrote the mini and I said, I've done some research, and I said, the Da Vinci Code, the film The Da Vinci Code, was filmed in your church. Mm -hmm. I sent you the lyrics. But remember, you've allowed that film to be out there. And if you allow that film to be out, that means you've, you, you've accepted all that it says about Christ and Mary Magdalene and everything. You've vouched for safe because you've allowed it. Now watch my tape. And if you say no to my tape, I'm going to say that you're doing it on the back of the fact that I'm Indian and this is about yoga. So just be prepared. Yeah. So I sent them the song. 
I sent this this email. I sent the lyrics. And I said, "This is what it is." Now think about how you reply to me. They came. They never came back. <laughs> they never came back. <laughs> so I said, "Right, that that means that you know they've supported it as much as they supported the Da Vinci Code because they filmed the Dan Brown song, they, the Dan Brown story. They filmed it in there, the Da Vinci Code. So I got away with it there." But Guru obviously wanted it to happen. <laughs> and then I got a Christ costume and I walked through the woods. You can see that person walking yeah. that to me. That video is hard to make, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> but um, I'm glad I did it. I'm really glad. Yeah. Listeners, I'll put a link to the, to the key into the uh, into the bio for this and, and to Chi Kree. Before we move on, why don't you tell us the, about, is it Chi Kree? What does it mean? And tell us a little about the logo that you have in the background, the Chikri logo, and what's inspired it. Yeah, so, so Chikri, Chi means energy, right? Uh, those of you that know martial arts will know Chi means energy or Ki in, in Japan. Chi is Chinese. Uh, same word as prana, essentially. Um, I was very much into martial arts as a, young, as a young boy. And Kri is the root verb for Kriya, Karma, all these different words. So Chikri means using your highest energy, prana, Chi, in all your actions. So it's whatever, which suits me very well because I do so many different types of actions. I just use my highest energy in all of those. When you put yoga at the end of it, it means with the aim of the result being union with God. So Chikri yoga means using all your energy, your highest energy in all your actions to connect with God. <clears throat> That's Chikri yoga. That's a symbol for it. Um, so there's six or seven elements. There's a cross in the middle symbolizing faith. There's a treble clef in there, which is the tail, which symbolizes creativity. Then you've got the horns at the top, which symbolize attack, it's being strong, being powerful, not being afraid. You've got a gate here, which symbolizes defense to protect your, your peace and your purity, to guard yourself at the same time. You've got the <clears throat> crescent-shaped moon, which Lord Shiva has on the side of his head, Shiva, Lord of Yoga. And you got the third eye at the top, five-pointed pentagonal third eye. <laughs> did you um? Did you create that? I did, yeah. And do you have a tattoo of it? It just looks like the most perfect tattoo in history. Ah, there it is. <laughs> of course. And I've got a chain of it here, so <laughs> very nice. We'll, we'll try and sell you some merch. <laughs> <laughs> People can get hold of that. I'll say. <laughs> That's cheap. Uh Maybe, maybe Neil, um, some of the work that you've done, there, there's an article of you being in Parliament. Tell us a little bit about that, because I looked at some of the pictures. You've got lords and kind of business uh, business yeah. magnets in there, and you know you've, you've got you've got very serious people looking a bit a bit bemused, but others looking supremely interested and committed to some of the poses that you're that you're doing. How, how was that experience for you? It was really good. That I was lucky enough to be asked first of all by the Indian High Commission in the UK to, to come forward to, they'd never done yoga in, in, a, in a room in the House of Lords before. <clears throat> so this was a first. Um, so I just took them through 20 minutes of yoga asanas, very simple asanas, just ones that they could do in suits, right? Because as you observed, they're all in suits coming out of meetings in the commons and in the Lords. Um, so just some hand exercises, some leg exercises, some simple tree poses, some standing stretches and bits and pieces and they did it and they were really happy to do it um and then just sat them down and said right meditation time to sit down and do some so they actually got on the floor and sat down and meditated but it was um it was good because it's in their minds now to, to, to do yoga um and if yoga nada wants it to be done then it will be done right that's that's the message is, is yoga had to go in there so yeah very happy, but it was on the back of World International Yoga Day, and it was the the, the, the first event that they ever did. Um, so they called me to do to 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 open it with two other organisations as well. Um, Isha Yoga and another one came to the to, to Parliament to do it. But then, um, yeah, I've been asked to do a few speeches in in the House of Commons as well on yoga, as many other yoga people have as well. That's a, that's a, quite a privilege, Neil. Yeah. Um, just going back, I don't think we covered the breathe or the knife crime project much. Tell yeah. us a tell us a little bit about that. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't even imagine how you'd tackle knife crime with yoga. Yeah, it's it's. I moved to this area. I'm in Kilburn at the moment, 
um, a few seven, seven, eight years ago. And I don't know if you know Kilburn. Do any of you know Kilburn? Yeah. 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 It could be a pretty rough area. I've got Westbourne Grove on the side of me, Labrick Grove, Kilburn here. Um, <clears throat> and where I am, I'm at the corner of three different boroughs in, in, in London. I'm at the corner of Camden, <clears throat> Brent and Westminster. And it's just sirens all day, all night, coming down the edge of the road. And they're all going left, right and centre. And I saw the incidents and increase in life crime in this area when I moved in. So as a yoga teacher, when I do breath counts, breathe in. One, two, three, exhale. One, two, three. And in my head, I'm just dancing. Right? It's all rhythms to me, rhythms. One, two, three, breathe out. One, two, three. So I always wanted to put these rhythms to, to a beat. So I thought it's a perfect time to get these kids on the street controlling their breath, which prana yama. Prana yama means control. So control of the breath means control of the nervous system, the cells, and the mind, right? In, in, in Chi Kriya Yoga, we teach this BPM, breaths per minute. So if you have a slow breath rate per minute, you have a slow mental movement per minute. So if I can get these kids breathing slowly to hip hop beats to begin with, I can get them calming down. If they can calm down, they can access wisdom. And if they can get wisdom, they can access the decision-making process which says, I'm not going to stab it. <laughs> hopefully at some point so that was my idea that let me get them breathing slowing down and then thinking twice about gangs and stabbing and I've seen this stuff before in my own eyes firsthand and it's, it's terrible so I made a song called breathe hashtag breathe um, which you can put on a link as well it's 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 all um, donation based just going out there and teaching kids to breathe so I go to schools workshops colleges um, and teach young kids from disenfranchised backgrounds and different elements of society about breathing gets them into yoga. Next thing you know, they're meditating and they're off the path of, hopefully off the path of killing and stabbing. And, and, and that's what I do. That's what I do. And um, we've got to do it. And again, coming back to the root core a part of myself, which is the no, no barriers yoga. <laughs> I take yoga into everything. So how, how do you actually approach um, a gang? How, how do you actually um, in, initiate that contact? Yeah, normally it's through community organisations, schools and colleges. I wouldn't go up to someone in the street and just... <laughs> God, breathe it. Breathe it. I won't be breathing myself very long after that. Um, you've got you to do it in a tactful way. So, you know, you, but I also what I did was I recorded songs. I, I recorded an album. Uh, called the Breathe Experience, which I put on, which people should download and 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 share with people because it's how they can get kids, and not even kids, just anybody breathing. First of all, to music, and then there are there are traditional breathing exercises on this album as well. It's the first album that I know of which, which has got hip hop music and meditations on it at the same time. And I think, by the way, mark my words, it will be the future. Not my songs, not my album other artists i think other artists will start putting music out which is also has meditations on the album which has positive thinking affirmations on the album i think artists will be the conduit the the, the if that's right word, the medium mm. for the message of yoga you know what because because i've come from a rap background and a yoga background i really believe the next prophet is going to be a yogi and i've said mm -hmm. it for years the next yogi is going to be a the next profit is going to be profit. a You know, it's funny you say that, um, not making too much of a connection here, but when I was watching The Voice UK uh, last year, I think it was, there were a couple of guys, rappers on there, and their message was really, really positive. And it was all about getting through COVID times, you know, coming together in union. And they really went far. It was, they were almost in the final stage, I think, because there was so much public support from them. So to your point, I think you're probably, you know, you're, you're right. The reason why it's very, very simple. When I was a kid in school, listening to rap music, I sat down one day and wrote all the lyrics to Grandmaster Millie Mel's White Lines. It's a song about anti-cocaine anti, um, use, yeah? And I wrote the lyrics, and I'm like, oh my God, there's 2,000 2, words here. And he's done, he's got, got them out in five minutes. And then you listen to Prince, and it will take him, you know, 
a, with a chorus and a couple of verses, maybe 200, 300 words, five minutes. How, much, how many more words is Grandmaster Melly Mel getting to his audience in five minutes? So Logic just told me, this stuff is powerful. Hip hop is powerful. Then when I became older and I realized in the key, for example, if you actually listen to it all, there's pages of words. And I got it out in six, five, six minutes. You can break down pretty much the basis of yoga from the key. Mm. Right? Hey. Mm. If I tried to sing that, I couldn't get it over. But in, in lyrics, in rap, you can get it over pretty quick. Sorry, you were saying. I, I just find it interesting that I feel like a lot of people, they're consuming media, all kinds of media, music, film, and they go by, they say, do I like it or not? It triggers something in them. But very rarely do people say, is it positive? Does it have a positive impact on my life? Is it the right message for me? And that's what you were just saying. And I, I feel like if I go through history about the popular music, I, don't, I feel like it's, it's like on a chart, it would go like downhill like this. <laughs> and I, I was all, I, if you say then that you feel like this would eventually move in the other direction, that would make me hopeful. Um, why do you why do you think that? And um, do you do you feel like as an artist, uh, people people will start to feel more the responsibility that they have for the messages they send out? I think, as you all know, one thing I know, and you can always rely on, is the fact that we're on we're on an ascending yoga cycle. Mm. The bottom line: it gives us as yogis, as 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 gurus, yogis, and shoot as rigis disciples via, via Yogananda and directly, we know there's hope. So in, in every area of life, we know that there's hope, we've just got to find it, okay? And with music, so coming back to music, you know, 70s, 80s, 60s, maybe 90s, you had to really qualify yourself to get into people's ears. You had to be a musician, or you had to be able to get into a studio and know how to work a studio. Nowadays, anybody and everyone can make music. And so the quality of, and the individuality of it all, because we're accessing so many different musicians, individuality goes down low because we're hearing 6,000 songs a day and everybody's making it. So quality is, it's hard to find very, very original, creative and interesting artists. So yes, I agree with you on your first point that music is, can be a little bit less interesting at the moment. But when I come back, another point is when we come back to the, the chakra system, yeah, You've got your creative chakras, your heart chakras, and then your spiritual chakras. So the human being goes through a process of being creative, expressive, and then spiritual. So music, pop music is evolving and will evolve into a space where it goes from just being creative for the sake of being creative to being more conscious and aware of people's feelings, the heart chakra, to then being an expression of spirituality. And it will go back, just like you guys will, towards where music was very spiritual before. If you go back in India to our, uh, probably all cultures, music was had a message. Now, the first rap song ever was called the Hanuman Chalisa, hmm. which you probably all know, right? It's a rap. It's, a, it's, it's, it's all, and I've broken it down in terms of modern hip hop, and the way that it goes is exactly as hip hop goes. And you can lay it to, people have rapped the Hanuman Chalisa. It's a perfect rap, and it's all about God and spirituality. So music will go back to becoming a spiritual tool because it's not interesting anymore. Like I said to you, no one stands out. You don't get your princes, your Michael Jacksons, your Madonnas, your, your individual super, your Beatles, your creative artists. They all sound the same. Music is very similar these days, right? Because everybody can do it. So then what's going to make it different? The message, the spirituality. How the, how the medium has been used by somebody to change the world. That's how music, and that's why I say, and because of the density of lyrics that you can put in it, somebody, I think I was a forerunner very, very early because I'd done all this stuff because I was lucky to have yoga and hip hop, but I won't be the one. Somebody will come after me bigger and better who's going to take hip hop and spirituality and change the world. It will happen. And I want, I, want to, I want to ask about a, a, a even more controversial topic, something that you do mentioned it, at the beginning it. of the call. And <laughs> it was <laughs> um, the Mahabharata story, right? And the, um, 
you mentioned about the UFOs being involved in there and you were kind of studying this, you were writing a book on this. Tell, tell us more about this, this uh, topic in this book that you're working on. Disclosure, this is a subject very close to Chris's heart. <laughs> Full disclosure, yeah. Marabat is a, is, a, is a massive area. Which area are you asking about more specifically, Chris? Well, to be, to be honest, I don't really know much about Vim, Maharaj. I think he's asking about Vimanas, Sorry. Vimanas and UFOs. Oh, the Vimanas. Yes. So this is one of the chapters I'm writing about. And I wrote it about three years ago, so it'll be from memory. But um, yeah, I mean, look, we had around the year 3000, 3500 BC, going back towards 7000, 7, 8000 BC, a heavy amount of um, Vimanas aircraft that we used to use around um, India and Sri Lanka. In fact, there are five sites in Sri Lanka which are were airports for Vimanas, which you can still go and visit. So these, these places, it was so busy, the air with Vimana, that the, the, there were airports in India and Sri Lanka that used to travel between country on these spacecraft. Now, you can call them spacecraft, or you could just call them old, old airplanes. Essentially, what we're saying is that they were flying aircraft existing 5,000 years ago, okay? Um, and there are, um, there's a yogi called Bhardwaj, this is coming from memory now, who actually had the um, recipe for how these things would work, okay? So largely they would work on mercury. So when we run out of fossil, basically what's gonna happen is that when we run out of fossil fuel, we'll be looking towards mercury as the main powerhouse for the, these spaceships. And uh, a lot of concoction, of, I won't go into it now, but there are recipes to make power um, which used to run these Vimanas before, which are now being tested in India to make aircraft, again, not using fossil fuel. Now, these aircrafts can go beyond the orbit and they can travel at directions and speeds way quicker than our normal aircraft. They're anti-gravitational um, and they can take power from the sun through the windscreen and turn it into power for the, for the like solar power. But they, they, this, this was very, very popular back in the day. Lord Krishna had a big battle with a with a, a lord, a king called King Shalva in the Mahabharata. And King Shalva and Lord Krishna had a battle in the sky, and they both used Vimana to battle. King Shalva's battle was, in, was incredible. It was, the aircraft was incredible. Lord Ravana stole Shiv, Lord, stole Sita, is it right? Yes. Stole Sita on a Vimana. He kidnapped her on using a Vimana to go from India. To, from Ayodhya back to Sri Lanka. So these are all common, very, very common. Um, they were as big as cruise ships. They were huge. They could be small and they could be absolutely huge. So we are going to come forward towards a set of machineries like Vimana again, probably in the year 4000, uh, fully, a very busy sky of these. And we will also have magnetic fuel by then as well. Magnetic fuel being the fuel that is, see remember with electricity, we get electricity from magnets, right? Essentially electricity is coming from a spinning magnet. Yep. Yeah. Um, but what will happen in the year 4000, 4099, is that we will get, we will be able to go into the magnet directly and take the power directly out of the magnet without having to spin it. The spinning part is where we need fossil yep. fuel or wind but we will be able to go into the magnet and say, hey, give me your power, because the magnet's in the power, power's in the magnet, not in the copper, it's in the magnet. We'll get it directly from the magnet and we'll make power from that. Now remember that a magnet is a soul trapped. Every single magnet is a soul trapped in an atom, is in the atom, yeah? So power, electricity is, 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 is derived from a soul. So coming back to your study, you, you would know from Sri Yukteswaraji's books that soul comes into, hits Maya, gets trapped in the four elements of Maya, the atom, vibration, time, and space. And it becomes the jit, becomes the enclosed soul. And that's magnetic, right? The right, the left, and the center column, the gunas that Sri Yukteswaraji talks about. We are, we are all magnets. Everything, every atom is a magnet. 
So all that happens is that there are certain uh, you know, stones that we found which are very dense magnets, they're called magnets, but everything is a magnet. And this is why finally, I'll stop talking in a second, the power will be deriving not from the magnet in the in, in Satya Yuga, the power will be derived from the atom in our own body. So that's how we fly finally. Well, wow. so you heard it, wow. heard it here first, people. Three prophecies. <laughs> There's first prophecy about the next you know, the future of rap music. Second one was about flying, flying uh, vimanas or flying vehicles. And then the third one was energy. So it's uh yeah. you, you would fly yourself. I bet, yeah, I bet, yeah, I bet people didn't realize, listeners, that they'd be getting uh, prophetic experiences in this pod. And it's not me, it's Sri Yukteswarji. <laughs> All you need to do is go to read the Holy Science. Mm. There's so much, so much in there. Yeah, we just uh, recently did an episode on the yugas and pretty much that whole book. Uh, Everything yeah. is in the Holy Science. There's nothing new from me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the gurus. Really interesting. I'm going to have to do more reading. On this subject sounds uh yeah sounds pretty pretty mind-blowing yeah. definitely uh definitely would read into it well thank you very much uh neil we covered a lot of topics and every single one of them super interesting it's amazing spend, to hear the work could, that you're doing could spend an hour on pretty much each of those topics yeah, that we spent yeah. five minutes on have couldn't we yeah. to another day maybe yes yeah hundred percent yeah, we yeah, would love to have you back on. Um, guys, is there anything from you? Do you want to ask any questions, Mike? Any any additional questions, any topics? It's, it's like something that I, I keep thinking about when I go to a yoga class. Why are always women doing yoga much more than men? Is there like, do you know a reason for that? I think, um, look, I think, God, without sounding super sexist here, I think a lot of guys tend to fall towards football and weight training and boxing and quite mm. quite vigorous, aggressive, I want to win things. <laughs> so I think, you know, they tend to go to football a lot in the evenings, a lot of guys that I know, a lot of people that I know. Women, again, without trying to sound too sexist, are much more, they're, they're actually quite spiritual by nature um, and more creative and more kind of into thinking about stuff a little bit more deeper so with yoga i think they're more, much more kind of it's much more akin to the kind of more sensitive compassionate side to a woman so potentially it's that having said that i think it's um yeah there's no real difference essentially because we're all souls inside but i think it's probably that i think it's the natural inclination of guys who want to go and beat stuff up and throw stuff around <laughs> we're a bit crazy like, i mean i enjoy the gym as well and i enjoy sports as well but i just who knows if it wasn't for my mom i may not have been a yoga teacher mm -hmm. put that out there <laughs> <laughs> who knows when yeah, uh, when think. yeah just when can we expect to uh, see a completion to your six year sojourn in the Mahabharata? project yeah. book i think probably put it this way i only do an hour an hour and a half every week on it because <laughs> i'm writing so much i'm doing so many things i just did it i just discipline myself to do before breakfast on a sunday or before breakfast on a saturday i just write without eating and just write right i think if we're lucky it will get done if 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 i'm lucky it will get done within three years then it'll be done. and where can we find the lyrics to some of your music because uh, there's some potent material in the lyrics as I have been listening. Is it is it on the actual, it's not in the bio of the video, is it? The lyrics of the key should be there. Okay. Um, lyrics I don't tend to print. I think if people want to see any lyrics, words, they'll be on um, the Chikri website. If you scroll down to the bottom and you look for Chikri poetry, I've put about 30 or 40 different lyrics there. They could be, even my poems are rhythmic ones. So. But also on the Chikri YouTube channel, there's probably about seven or eight different raps there. So if people want to listen to them, they can listen to them there if they feel awesome. like. Awesome. Yeah, in one of my local schools, Hatch and High School, I saw that you had a video where you went and did an assembly. Went, yeah. <laughs> uh, assembly there, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I read the same skies there and um, got some kid down from the top to do some beatboxing with me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome video, guys. You should uh, watch that one. Yeah. Um, Anything else? There's, there's a great quote. Well, I can finish on this. 
on your website under the gurus uh, tab and it reads uh, i will bow i always bow to the guru who is bliss incarnate who bestows happiness whose face is radiant with joy his essential nature is knowledge he is aware of his true self he is the lord of yogis he is adorable he is the physician who cures the disease and birth of death and death Sri Guru Gita, verse 93. Mm -hmm. Then you have the information of the uh, SRF Gurus, Paramahansaji, Sri Teshwar, Sri Mahashwar, Babaji out there. So, Jai Guru. Jai Guru, thank you everyone. Thank it's been a privilege. Pleasure. Jai Guru.